my daddy said he was in the bedroom one night and this voice came to him and said, I need you to start a church. And my daddy said, do you know how old I am? He's already 69 plus. And someone within him spoke and said, I need you to start a church for the saving of your family. I need you to start a church for the saving of your family. Hebrews chapter number 11 around verse 6 and 7 says that Noah built an ark by faith for the saving of his family. My daddy said, you want me to tell my wife this? He said, yes. And call Corletta. Hallelujah. Something within me. I'm stuck. That holdeth the reins. My daddy said, I'm, I'm already in my career. I'm already getting ready to come into retirement. But it's someone within me. <laughs> Banishes pain. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Someone within me. It'll be shy. Sometimes I just can't explain what they're going to say. Tell them all that you know. There is someone with, within how many of you hear that voice telling you to do unusual things and you wrestle and you fight with it? And you say, I don't have the money, I don't have the resources, I don't have the support, I'm too old, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm too male, I'm too female. All of these things that we raise up to not obey that voice. How many more things would be fixed in our world if we all obeyed someone within me that holdeth the reins oh good God someone within me he banishes pain oh glory to God Someone within me. Sometimes I just cannot explain. Lift your hands if you know what I'm talking about. Say it with me. All that I know. There is someone. Within. Oh, God, we thank you. I just have a scripture to read for you. You don't have to turn to it yet, but just hear it in the reading. Just try to hear it in your spirit. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. You may be seated for five minutes, ten minutes or so. I just want to talk about one man's obedience. Just one man's obedience. Many can be made righteous. Hold your Bible to your chest and say, this is my Bible. And I believe what it says. And I'm ready to hear the word of the Lord and believe it in my heart. And where I have need of change, I shall be changed. One man's obedience, Brother James. One man's disobedience brought us into condemnation 
and judgment and death. And one man's obedience, and in the text we're speaking of the man Christ Jesus, that he made many righteous. But I don't believe it stops with Jesus. I said to Pastor Gill as we were driving this morning, when I looked out among our schools and I looked out among our city and our country, particularly in the urban community, and you may not agree and it's all right, it won't be the first time. People ask me, what is the problem with our schools? Chronic absenteeism. Literacy with reading and math. Homelessness, poverty. The other day I met 80 refugees. Children that have come from other countries undocumented that we protect in our district. Many of you don't realize that Detroit Public Schools Community District is a by resolution of the board, that it is a safe district, which means that immigration cannot come in. They were, under the previous administration, snatching our children from their schools, from the playgrounds. And so the board and the superintendent came together in an emergency meeting, and we wrote a resolution that no one could do that in our district. And so now we're accepting Last week, Friday, 80 refugee children in our Southwest community schools. We have many undocumented. Amen. Let's praise God for. Amen. 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 And you don't hear that. You don't hear that a lot. And, you know, as we are going with these coats throughout the district, thanks to HAP and thanks to now Ford and others, faith-based community leaders that have given us the funds, and one little board member that believed it's necessary to get it done. Amen? And that is not to despise others. I certainly do celebrate uh, uh, Angelique Mayberry-Peterson, our, our chair. Come on, I do celebrate her. And I, and I celebrate uh, my superintendent, Dr. Nikolai Viti, and certainly Assistant Superintendent Shalana Buckman, who said to me, Bishop, go ahead and do it. But when I look out and I see these families and I see these children, and then we keep talking about 77% during the pandemic of chronic absenteeism. And everybody says, we need to do this, we need to do that. <clears throat> we need to go into homes, we need to do this. We need, and everybody, you know, that has a, 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 some kind of uh, money, they can print up a flyer, they can do all kinds of stuff and buy commercial time, but that doesn't solve the real problems. And so I, I, I've been praying about this. I've been praying about this. Somebody said she's been praying about this. I said, what is the root cause of this? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, fatherlessness. Nobody going to hear me, but you, you better. You better hear what I'm saying to you. The, 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 the elephant in the room. No child just wakes up and wants to go to school. Ain't, nobody, ain't no children running all over the house. I get to go to school tomorrow. I get to go to school. I'm going to school. I'm going to school. I'm going to school. No. Children haven't changed. But when you are raising children alone as a woman and you are working two or three jobs because you're underpaid and you're overworked, you don't get to spend the time with your children to read. You don't have the time to sit down and do homework. You have not had the time to learn technology. You have not had the opportunity
opportunity to finish your degree. But you got these children. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in an era where it took a man and a woman to make a baby. I, I don't know. Maybe some stuff didn't change. I don't know. But as I recall, I got a little experience. I, I got at least two times. The two women cannot make a baby. And two men cannot make a baby. So, some, somebody stay with me. I'm going to say it again. Two women cannot make a baby. Now, you can get married. I ain't, got, I ain't got nothing to say about that. But what I can say is that two women cannot make a baby. Two men, y'all can get married. Be in love. I ain't got nothing to do with that. But you cannot make a baby. The last time I checked, Sister Kirkland, it took a man on a woman to make a baby. That means that that woman who is working two jobs, three jobs with four children, is missing somebody who helped make those babies. We were in on the schools last week, went to five schools last week, and um, in each school we, we have a little program and it is our intent to get parents to speak during these times because they are the ones that are impacted by the generosity of those who are giving out these coats. We had the Chinese American believers to come and they made blankets. We had others to make hats and gloves while we purchased the coats. And one of the mothers got up and she was just saying how much of a blessing it was for her four children to get new coats. And she just broke down and started crying. And one of our faith partners kind of went to her and I could see something else was going on. So about 10 minutes later, we were passing out coats. They came and got me. I said, where are you taking me? She said, come on, Bishop. So I go in the room and there was the same mother. And she says, I'm homeless. Well, now all of the children that we have designated to receive coats are part of our homeless population. So that didn't surprise me. Your children are getting coats. You're here, so that says you're homeless. She said, no, you don't understand. We've been sleeping in the car. And I said, how many children do you have? She has six, but I have four with me. And one is a special needs child. My question, where is their father? Chronic absenteeism is not an issue of education. It is the outcome of fatherlessness. Because a father in the home who is responsible for those children would make sure that both the woman and the child or children are doing what they're supposed to do. Y'all know you ain't going to like me. As powerful as God is, Jesus needed a daddy. Okay, ain't nobody going to like me up in here. I can get her pregnant, but I can't raise the child. So Joseph, I'm going to choose you to raise my baby. 
because the boy still needed a daddy. That's a sermon that is a classic from Pastor Gilbert Vaughn. Come on, somebody. And so it, it says to me that if Jesus needed a man in the house, I'm not, I'm not renouncing the strength of strong women that can raise a child without a man. I'm not in any way saying that it cannot be done. I'm not in any way saying that if you are a woman that you have still a responsibility to raise your child whether their father is there or not. I'm not dispersing or dis dismantling or trying to deconstruct that there are foster mothers and adopted mothers who see a need and there is no man. But that's not the perfect will of God. That is God's will because the perfect will of God has been violated. When men have children, by women and do not parent them and do not, I'm going to say it, parent their children. Okay, let me say this again. When men have children with women, because they can't have them with men, and do not parent their children, poverty, Failure, incarceration, drug addiction, come on here, rape, molestation, violation, everything that you could possibly name happens when a father is disobedient. Fathers are disobedient. That daughter suffers in her self-esteem. Suffers in her self-worth, her value. She is not affirmed. She doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know her value proposition. And so some other person that is male or some other weird female begins to speak into her life and derails her purpose. I, I was a young girl once. I know y'all can't believe this. But there was this boy that came to the city. His name was Wendell. I don't even know his last name. He was the nephew of a deacon in our church. Deacon Minor. And, uh, I don't know he came every year and you know I kind of liked him and he kind of liked me he was a little older he was like 18 19 I was probably 13 14 so we concocted this plan now my mother worked at night she had a beauty shop but at night she worked as a nurse in the nursing home so the only person home was my father say father so we concocted this plan, Sister Sherry, and uh, our plan was that after my mother went to work, that we were going to go and sneak outside. Now, I don't know what we're going to do because I'm still not clear. I, I don't have an agenda. I, I'm just going along to get along. I like him. He like me. So why don't we go outside? I still don't know was he's got up his sleeve or up his pants leg, whichever one you want to choose. Now, as I look back, I see it. But at that point, I was still innocent and vulnerable, you're not, you know, just vulnerable. And so, so our plan looked like it was working. So we had clocked out times, wasn't no cell phones, so you couldn't call the house because daddy would answer the phone. Ruthie, Ruthie can tell you about the story of the boy calling her. And daddy said, oh, uh, sir, uh, sir, I think you got the wrong number. <laughs> uh, call after 8 o'clock. 
you just a little bit too late. Ruth is asleep. So I sneak out the house. We had long back stairs, had a garage, and I remember he had a gray impala. I run, I get in the car. He said, get in the back, get in the back. I still don't know what's up with my dumb butt. And so now, you know, he says, may I kiss you? I said, I think so. I'm so, I'm so green. I'm greener than a frog. And so the windows start fogging up. I don't know what's next, but I'm going along to get along. I hear this on the window. He said, who is that? I said, I don't know. My daddy says, Carletta. Roll this window down. So that was my father. I rolled the window down. He looked in that car. He said, young man. He said, when you leave here tonight, don't you ever come back to the city of Detroit. He said, now unlock this door. He leaned over. He unlocked the door. My daddy opened the door and pulled me out. And when we got in the house, he said, now that's between you and me. Now you get in there and you go to bed. Did you think I didn't hear you when you went down the steps? Did you think I didn't hear you when that door opened? He said, ain't no man going to come in here and steal my door. You go in there, you go to bed. Come on, somebody. By one man's obedience. My mother was at work. And now that I look back at that moment, that could have ruined my life for the rest of my life. That would have derailed my, my life. That would have derailed God's plan for me. I was clueless for years. I had no idea. And let me tell you something. That guy never came back to the border. He said, my daddy said, don't let me see you at the borders of Detroit. Or I will have you arrested. I didn't know what that meant. That's statutory rape. I was 13, 12 or 13, 14. He was 18, 19. Now imagine what is happening in our homes. When a mother is working two and three jobs and those children are left at home, you cannot be surprised at teenage pregnancies. You cannot be surprised at young boys who are slipping out of the house at night, stealing cars and carjacking and robbing. Because it is the father that protects the boundaries of his family. Okay, nobody going to like me today. I'm almost finished. You should be shouting right now. Come on here. I said, come on and praise God right there. And my heart always goes out to women who had not that experience of a protective praying father. My father wasn't no saved man. When I was growing up, my daddy wasn't a saved man. My daddy was a barber. So Barbara Beauty and Barbara Supply Salesman, and he met my mama in our beauty shop, and the rest is history.
he, he was supposed to be selling pressing combs and hair grease. And curling irons. <laughs> and shampoo. Brother Charlie, I, that was what he was supposed to be selling. But, I, but he found out that uh, 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 maybe I can get a little something else at this particular shop. Fooled around and got a wife. So I, my heart always goes out to women, particularly girls, who have not had the beauty of that experience. And I get it. I get it when I run into women and I see their struggle with life. And I ask them, where was your father? Where was your father when you started doing drugs? Where was your father when you started turning tricks? Where was your father when you started having babies? Where was your father? I don't ever ask for their mother. Where was your father when you started smoking weed? Where was your father when you took your first snort of crack? Where was your daddy? Where was your father? Where was your daddy? Where was your father when you wanted to have sex at 12? Where was your father? When you decided to drop out of school, where was your father? My daddy wasn't a Christian man. No, he was Christian, but he wasn't saved. And I remember him smoking seven cigarettes. And he would have me to go light them on the stove. And my mother came up from the shop one day. My daddy was a good provider. He took her off of the North End in her own beauty shop and had a beauty shop built in the basement of the home so that she could be home to raise me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had about eight years by myself. And then suddenly, like a mighty Russian wind, Five more folks showed up. My mother came up the steps, and I was standing at the stove with this cigarette. And she said, what are you doing? I said, Daddy told me to light it. He said, give me, give me that. And she went in, and her and Daddy went in, there in her bedroom. Because at that time, they didn't even sleep in the same room. I'm back in the day. Daddy had his room, mama had her room. I never knew why they was walking in the middle of the night, but you know. I found out. <laughs> and when he came out, not only did he not do that again, he stopped smoking. And this is what my mother told me later. She said, I told him, your daughter is of age now. And everything you do, she's going to want to do. Do you want her smoking? That's the power of a father. When I was growing up, I didn't put on my mother's clothes. I put on my daddy's clothes. My daddy came home one day and I was in there with his shoes. <laughs> and I had on his shirt and then mama came and said, okay. I had on his little jacket. My daddy was very classy. He was very elegant. And when he came home, I had on his hat. I got to find that picture somewhere. I'm about four years old. How impressionable was I at that point? to be even standing here now 50 years later and I still have on his shoes. I still have on his hat. Come on now. I still have on his shirt. I still have on his jacket. I still am carrying the mantle of my father. 
last night that he lived in the earth, Gil and I were across the street, and the phone rang, and it was the hospital. We jumped up, and we went to the hospital, and I sat on the side of the bed. My dad was still breathing, still talking. He was looking out the window. I said, Dad, what do you see? He didn't say nothing. I said, Daddy, what do you see? And he took his little oxygen mask off. And he said, you're going to be all right. I said, are you trying to go? You're trying to leave? I said, what about the church? Thought that would ring a bell with him. He took that oxygen mask off and he said, you got it. By one man's obedience, many are made righteous. Ezekiel talks about the disobedience of a father and how it goes down to the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth generation. He talks about how when men disobey, when fathers disobey, it sets the children's teeth on edge. And when a father is disobedient to God, when a father is not present, that children have to fight for life. They have to fight for value. They have to fight for, for esteem. They have to fight for it. And their teeth are set on edge. In other words, they are never at rest. They are never at peace. Because they're always fighting for their place in life. Because it is a father that gives that child their place in life. That defines their boundaries and their borders of life. It was my father one day, I was walking out of the house. And I kind of come into that, that moment in my life, y'all know. And I heard my daddy say, <clears throat> Mama, <clears throat> it's time for, for you to, she need a girl. Look like two little boys back there fighting. <laughs> that day, we went to Winkleman's. That day. I got fitted for a bra and a girdle. And when you see these girls out in the street in their pajamas and in their bonnets, I guarantee you there is no father. My father would never let me go out in the street in pajamas. My father would never let me go out in the street with a sleep bonnet on my head. When you see it happening, folks, I want you to be able to identify what is the root. The root is fatherlessness. That is what has gripped our culture. not that they are not strong mothers. It's not that there are not strong women. It's not that women are not doing their best. But she didn't make the child by herself. And there is a part of that child that emotionally cannot be developed. Socially cannot be developed. Mentally cannot be developed. It was my father that would come home with money in his pocket and would put all of his change in the top drawer. And when I got of age, he brought me in his room and he said, all of this belongs to you. It is a father that establishes posterity for their children. 
It is a good man that leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Not a good mother. Not a good woman. But a good man. How have we failed in our culture? He said, now I'm going to teach you how to count money. Started with pennies, and we would roll them. How many pennies in that? That's 100 pennies. How much is that? Then we would roll nickels. And every week, we would roll. On Saturday, he would take me to the National Bank of Detroit, and we would buy savings bonds. He would stand me up on a stool to talk to the teller and open up a bank account with my name on it. <clears throat> he said, if your sister needs money, whatever you take out of this drawer, you write it down. And at the end of the week, you and I will do the accounting. cannot be who I am without the memories of my father. When you get sick, you're going to get some turpentine, oil of tar, on a spoon with rock candy, and gin, and you're going to drink it. And the next morning, you're going to school. But I'm dying. Okay. If you die in school, they're going to call me. But until you die, you're going to school. Is your homework done? Yes, sir. Let me see it. Not my mother. My father. When my brothers and sisters got in trouble, the teacher said, uh, I don't want to see your mother. I want to see your father. This is not to discourage anyone that didn't have it. This is to encourage us to get it right. This is to encourage us to not repeat the same cycle, folks. This is not to discourage you. No matter where you are in your course of life, no matter where you are, you can make a course correction right now. You can make the course correction. You can say, listen, God, I, 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 I didn't know or I didn't understand the fullness of it, but Lord, from today, I understand that one man's obedience can save many from unrighteousness. Listen to this and I'm through. It said, therefore, through one man's offense, verse 18, and I'm almost done here. And let me just go back, if you will, if you open your Bibles to Romans chapter number 5, and I'm going to be done. Verse 17, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Christ Jesus. Verse 18, therefore, as the one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in what? Condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. Watch this, watch this. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, 
So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. We know that in this particular pericope, we are dealing with the first Adam and the last Adam. We know that we are dealing with Adam in the garden being disobedient and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When God clearly told him not to. You have all of these other trees that you can eat from except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I don't know where the apple came from. I don't know how we got to Apple. I'm Android, and I stay Android because I see the trouble that Apple gets people in. But, but somehow, from, from this, from, from as long as I know, they have made it an apple. But I want us to understand, I don't know how it manifested, but what the tree was, was the knowledge of good and evil. And that was something that God never intended man to know. Man was never to know or to have knowledge of good and evil. Y'all not going to say nothing now. That was never God's intent. He said, now in the midst of the garden, there is the tree of life. And out of all of the trees of the garden, you may eat. Out of all of the trees of the garden, you have everything you need. Vegetation, fruit, you have everything. But one tree you are to avoid. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What that does to a man. Notice that when the woman ate, there was no consequence. It's quiet in this joint. This joint then went all the way quiet. The joint then went all the way quiet. I done, I done went from Pentecostalism to Lutheranism. Oh, wait a minute, not the Lutherans, because I like the Lutherans. We, we done went all the way to something. I don't know. <laughs> but what happens, Kirkland, when a man is exposed to the knowledge of good? You may not like this, but there will never be prostitutes if there was never pimps. No girl grows up to want to be a trick. It is a man who has eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that perverts the use of a woman from a wife to a whore. That I don't want Adam to have the knowledge of good and evil. Because if Adam has the knowledge of good and evil, he will not choose life. We are living in a world where men are still choosing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why we have human trafficking. That's why we have pedophiles. That's why we have a $19 billion industry of pornography. Okay, nobody's going to like me. Yeah, come on, let, let, let me just talk to us. Women, listen, this, this will help you to understand. When a man has eaten from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, the book says in Romans chapter number one that he will pervert the use of a woman. Then instead of her being a wife, she will become a slut and he will turn her over and abuse her sexually.
Why? Because he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is a man that tricks out a little girl. It's a man that tricks out a little boy. Homosexuality did not come into this world because of women. It came into this world because of a man. It was, it was the men that knocked on the door, come on now, and said, I want those men in there. And the man said, I got girls that are virgins. We don't want your daughters. We want their husbands. Because they had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By one man's disobedience, sin has entered. Now, not only has sin entered, but sin has permeated. Men, when you watch pornography, you are feeding an industry that exploits your daughters, your granddaughters, your nieces, your nephews. You are feeding an industry that exploits women. You think you're just sitting there enjoying yourself by yourself? No. Because you prefer the tree of knowledge of good and evil over the tree of life. Get a wife. Get a wife. And stay with your wife and do what you want to do with your wife. You don't have to look at a computer to be aroused. You can have a wife in your arms that covers you, that protects you and prays for you. You are exploiting women. You are feeding an industry that exploits girls. And then you have the right, you think, to say what happens with a woman's body after you put your seed in her and you don't want to take care of what you have sown and you think legally you have a right to tell her what she can and cannot do. By one man's disobedience, sin has entered and has destroyed children. I'm looking at him in school, struggling to read. Where is your father? Where's your mother? She's at work. Where's your dad? I don't know. He's in jail. He's, he's on drugs. He's in the streets. But by one man's obedience, many are brought into righteousness. Fifty years ago, one man's obedience From the man's obedience of 2,000 years ago until this man's obedience 50 years ago, 1972, many have been made righteous. And this little church on 935, has gone into all of the parts of the earth 
And now you, Sherry's all over the world raising business. Others are doing social justice, and many of you are doing amazing things, even on your jobs. You are holding down your homes, and you're holding down your communities because of one man's obedience. Because of one man's obedience, 25,000 coats are being given out in the Detroit public schools. Because of one man's obedience. They see me. But it's not by one woman's obedience. It's by one man's obedience. It's one man's obedience that has caused faith to come back into public education in the city of Detroit. It is by one man's obedience that music is heard all over the world because of that daughter. It is by one man's obedience that my daughter can serve the United States Navy for over 20 years. It's by one man's, you see us, but behind us and up underneath us is one man's obedience. By one man's obedience. We get to hear a Charles Dove, a James Shelton. We get to meet a Felix Corto. We get to meet all of you that are on television and watching us. By one man's obedience every morning, over 1,500 people are watching the school of the Holy Spirit. By one man's obedience. By one man's obedience. People are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Children are receiving the Holy Spirit through Valerie McCune. By one man's obedience. The Wilsons have, have supported a church and have made it work even down to their dogs. Come on, somebody. By one man's obedience, we see go tell it ministry all over the world. By one man's obedience, we get a dentist from Ghana. By one man's obedience, y'all not going to say nothing. We save a generation. By one man's obedience, we have a shocker. By one man's obedience, we have an album that is 20 plus years old that we still can't keep in stock. By one man's obedience, many are made righteous. By one man's obedience, this house shall rebound. This church cannot die. By one man's obedience, this election will be won. And victory shall be ours. Stand on your feet and let's praise God for one man's obedience. Reverend Henry and Lewis, come on somebody. By one man's obedience. A woman by the name of Jesse Lewis said, Daddy, if God said it, I'll do it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We give you praise right now by one man's obedience. That faith produces obedience. And it is by obedience our faith is revealed. When we can obey God, our faith is manifested. When God gives each of us an assignment and we know that God has spoken to our hearts, it is one man's obedience that can produce a generation of daughters, a generation of wives, a generation of mothers. By one man's obedience, we produce scholars and judges. We produce governors. We produce secretaries of state. We produce attorney generals by one man's obedience we see faith in action in our public square by one man's obedience we see social justice we see women's rights by one man's obedience we can empty prisons by one man's obedience we can train a generation all oh, that men would obey God. All oh, that men would eat from the tree of life. And God, I thank you 
that men today would feel a sense of conviction and a sense even now of repentance that God, they can do a better job of being obedient. By one man's obedience, this house can be raised back up. By one man's obedience, we can see men come back into this house. By one man's obedience, we can see Rafa Warrior singing again. By one man's obedience, we can see the men's ministry flourish. By one man's obedience, we can see families come back to God and children baptized in the Holy Spirit. By one man's obedience. Hallelujah. God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Come on, open your mouth and begin to pray in the spirit right now. Hallelujah. You are Alpha and Omega. <clears throat> Come on, sing it. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be. Come on, everybody sing it. Hands are lifted. Come on. You are out. Come on, sing it.
for righteousness.
worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. We worship you, our Lord. You're so to be praised. We worship you, oh Lord. You are so worthy to be praised. your hands. Tell him, your obedience, Lord, I worship. Your obedience made me whole. Your obedience led me to mercy. It was your obedience. That saved my soul. Your obedience, come on. Jesus, I worship. Your obedience has made me whole. Your obedience led me to mercy. Thank you. God, your obedience has saved my soul. Lift your hands. Tell him, your obedience, Lord, I worship. Lord, I worship. Come on, tell him. Your obedience, your obedience made me whole. Made me whole. Your obedience. Your obedience led me to mercy.
mercy. Let me into mercy. Your obedience. Your obedience. Save my soul. One man's obedience. Your obedience. right now one more time everybody oh, 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 oh. hallelujah you don't know Jesus as your savior you're missing out on a treat you're missing the greatest decision of your life. Why not make Jesus the Lord of your life today? Why don't you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You can do it right there in your seat. You can do it right there in your homes. Right wherever you are. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Take over my life and give me your Holy Spirit that I may live the rest of my life for you. Help me with my struggles. Help me with my dispositions, personalities, lusts, appetites. Help me with my sin of choice. Help me. Save me. Deliver me. And help me to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And I'll live the rest of my life for you. There are those of you that are here today, you're already saved, but there needs to be some tightening up. Come on, let's just pray that. Lord Jesus, tighten me up. Give me some tightening. Tighten me up. Tighten me up. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Tighten me up, Lord. That I am obedient. Ooh. Oh. 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 Tighten me up by the Spirit. Give me back some boundaries. Give me back some clear boundaries. Oh, 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 oh. help me to do what I heard you say do that I don't want to do. <laughs> yes. Oh, 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 oh. Help me to choose life. Oh, oh, oh. oh.
we celebrate this Founders Day. And as an act of our celebration, we yield our obedience. We make a new decision today that obedience is the outcome of our faith. We don't obey because we want to. We don't obey because we like it. We obey because of our faith. And the expression of our faith is obedience. There is nothing else that God desires from us more than our obedience. So why have you not obeyed God? He told you to destroy everything. He told you to get rid of everything. Saul said, but the people, he said, no, God spoke to you. He doesn't desire your sacrifice. He desires your obedience. For obedience is better than a sacrifice. Hallelujah. Today, Lord, we thank you that you have given us the way of righteousness and you've given us the model of our faith. For you said to mark the perfect man and follow him. You said that you would give us examples of faith, patriarchs. And today, our founder, we model his faith through our obedience. And wherever we are disobedient and wherever we're justifying it forgive us and cause us now to want to obey in Jesus name for by our obedience many are made righteous thank you father in Jesus name Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, clap, clap, clap. Hallelujah. 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 We give God praise. How many of you received the word today? Hallelujah. We give God praise. Let us get ready to take communion this morning. You have been given that, that is the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus as we will prepare it now. As always, our altars are open for giving at any time. I want to thank God for Minstrel James Robinson. And I want to thank God for our, our music director, James Shelton. These are men who are fathers in their families. Come on, somebody. I said, let's thank God. Can you open your mouth and let's thank God. Let's thank God for them that they, we have seen their example. For Deacon Daryl Wilson, come on, we have seen their example of manhood. And even as Dove's boys have gotten older, he has still fathered them. Let's praise God for Brother Charles Dove. Let's praise God for Gilbert Vaughn and all of the men that we know are still fathering. Brother Charles, come on, that are fathering their children. I'm here to tell you that a child with a father has a greater advantage than a child without. And I just want that to be known right now. God's plan is still the best. God spoke something to me the other day. He said, there's nothing better out here than what I've already given you. I was like, whoa. Not psychology, not, not, not medicine, not prescriptions, not mental health. He said, there's nothing out here better than what I've already given you. And I was like, wow. He said, all of these other things are created because y'all won't do what I want you to do. But there's nothing out here better than what I've already given you. The blood, the cross, the empty tomb, the word, 
and the Holy Ghost and the local church, there's nothing better than what I've already given you. I gave you a family structure. There's nothing better. You want to cure chronic absenteeism? Get back to my structure. You want to cure low graduation rates? Get back to my structure. You want to cure poverty? Get back to my structure. You think that other people have more money than me? I said, no, God. He said, but man won't obey me. But if you get back to my structure, I'll cure and I'll heal the land. Father, we thank you. And so upon that promise, we now get ready to receive the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we believe that what Jesus has given us is better than everything else. His body and his blood still redeems. After everybody has tried everything else, all the dope, all the liquor, all the alcohol, all the food, come on, all the sex, after you have tried everything, this little piece of bread and this little cup of wine, hallelujah, still has power. Wonderful power. Hallelujah. On the hill there's a cross. And on the cross there is blood for me. For me. On that hill there's a cross. And on the cross there is blood for me. Thank you God. For me. And it still has that power, wonderful power, come on, to heal my diseases, come on, <laughs> and to cover my weakness, and it still has that power, uh, wonderful power, to heal my diseases. And to cover my weakness. Come on, everybody, say it. So on that hill, there's a cross. And on that cross, there is blood for me. Oh, yes. For me. Come on, sing it. On the hill, there's a cross. And on that cross, there is blood nothing better. There's nothing better. Say everybody on the hill. On the hill there's a cross and on that cross there is blood for me. Oh yes. For me. One more time lift your bread. On the hill there's a cross and on that cross Still as the power, wonderful power to heal my diseases and to cover my weakness, and it still has that power, that wonderful power to heal my diseases and to cover. Take your bread lift it up before the Lord. Father, we thank you for the body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for us. We break it now together and we thank you that we do it in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, let us eat together. And still has that power. Wonderful power. And to cover my weakness. Good God Almighty still has that power. A wonderful, wonderful power. Miracle power to heal my diseases and to cover my weakness. Oh, just say it one more time. Lift 
the cup still has the power. Miracle power hey, to heal my diseases uh, and to cover my weakness. Father, we lift this cup before you. For you have said to us that we are to do it. And as often as we do it, we do it in remembrance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And on the same night that he was betrayed, that he took the bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He took the cup and he lifted it up and said to them, for this is the blood of the new covenant. And as often as you do it, you show forth my death until I come again. Now together, we thank you. We drink it together. Still has power. Yes, yes, yes. Miracle power. To heal my diseases. And to cover my weakness. Cover, cover my weakness. And on the hill there's a cross. And on the cross. seat for just a moment. Founders Day is really coming to a conclusion of our year of celebration. And it is also the day that our assessments should now be coming due. Amen. I want to thank God for those of you that have already been giving all year. But today is the day that we set aside for our assessments. And we asked every person a $1,000 seed. And many of you have been giving it throughout the year. So I'm going to ask if you have been giving it, would you stand on your feet? You've already been giving it. Please stand on your feet. If you've already been sowing into it, just stand on your feet. Come on, we praise God for those of you that have been making installments. Come on, let's give God praise for them. Still has power. Keep standing on your feet. And for those of you that are waiting to start today, and you are ready to begin to make your investment in your church's future and past, past and future. Today is the day that our $1,000 seed is due. Now you have basically until the end of this month. And so I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet if you're getting ready and you're preparing to give that investment this month. Would you stand on your feet quickly? quickly if you're planning to do it amen thank you so much thank you so much all right thank you thank you thank you so much this is the month that we said we would do it now I want you to believe God I want you to talk to God we've had all year to do this we've had almost 11 months praise God amen and really that's about a hundred dollars a month praise the Lord and it's a lot easier when you do it in installments. Amen. And I don't want you to go out here and do nothing crazy and try to get it all of a sudden. No scratches. Come on. No itches. No scratches. But today is the day that we are to give our assessments. Now, that has nothing to do with your tithes and offerings. For your tithes and offerings is a separate thing that you do every week that you put aside. Amen. I'm not going to get no amens now. I already know it. I, know, I already know that I'm out here by myself. Keep standing on your feet. Amen. If you plan to give, if you're giving this month, I want you to stand. Now, there is an envelope that has Holy Ghost Cathedral, Golden Jubilee, 50 years, 1972 to 2022. This is the envelope for your assessment. This is the envelope that we are giving in. Now, if today is your first day of giving, please Put on there what you pledge. You can give $1,000, $2,500, or $5,000. But whatever it is, this is the day. The chief is walking around with these envelopes. Please put your hand up if you need an envelope. If you're giving by electronic, it's fine. But please put in the chat, whether it is uh, by PayPal or whether it is by Cash App, put in there that this is your Jubilee 
seed, the Jubilee seed, amen, but still fill out an envelope and put in the envelope that you gave it electronic, that you gave it electronically, amen. Now, that is the set amount for our pledge this year is 1000 You can give 10000 you can get 50000 Come on here, one for every year. Will, will there be one? Will, will, will there be one? In Jesus' name, somebody say soon. Somebody say it might be me soon. Praise the Lord. But this is the year. Now, $1,000 per person is not $1,000 per household. That's not 500 between you and your, your mate. No, that's 1000 but it's 1000 per person, per member. And that is what we have asked since the beginning of the year. So this is the day, Founders Day, that we said we would culminate it. But understanding that we're in a pandemic and things have not been as fluid as you may have liked it, we know that we may have to go to the end of the year. We may have to go to the end of the year for you to do it. But I want you to do it. And I don't want you to do it next year. I want you to do it this year. If it take you to the 31st at 1059, I want you to do it this year. Now, I've been out, you know, for the last few weeks. And I want to celebrate Pastor Valerie McCune for taking our young people through their faith extreme makeover. Uh, but I'm back. Praise Jesus. Now, next Sunday, Pastor Gilbert is going to be preaching, so I don't want you to get ready for that. He just found out, too. But by one man's obedience, many are made righteous. This is vitally important, not just for the church, but for your faith and for your prosperity in 2023. And you know, I don't fool around with your money. I don't come to you, but this is something God told me that we have to do. And it's not about breaking the curse of poverty. This is not about what you're going to get out of. This is an investment in the ministry that feeds you. That feeds your family through you. That establishes a bank account of righteousness when you're gone, that God, I gave to the house, and I know my children are going to be all right. I know Alan is going to be all right because I give to my house. I know Alan is going to be just fine. When I get ready to go home to be with the Lord, and that's a long time from now, praise God. I expect him to be at least 20 when that happens, or 25, or even 30. I'll take all of it. But I want to see him prosper in the house that his great-grandfather established. That God has grafted him in to the inheritance of Henry Lewis. Hallelujah. When I look at these twins, I knew those babies in their mother's womb. That's why I don't take no foolishness off of them. They show out, now show out with them. You ain't going to never show out more than me. You bite me, I bite you back. Go ahead on and show out. Watch me show out. You don't want me showing out. But their mother invested. And now they have a legacy and their children have a legacy. Amen. So this $1,000 seed, $10,000 seed, $50,000. You know, if you get it in your heart, God, I want to give $5,000. Do you believe that God will give it to you? He will do it. Don't just, what I tell you all about bold prayers. Don't just pray, God, give me 1000 God, give me 10 God, give me 5 God, let me do 50 Bold prayers. Because you believe in what one man's obedience is doing. 
So, Father, we thank you. We lift up our envelope to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you that this month will culminate our giving. Even those that may need more time, God, provide for them. Because it's in their heart to do it. That the house of God is established going into the next year. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go ahead and fill out your envelopes. Praise God. I thank God for all of you this morning. This has been glorious. Have you enjoyed yourself? Yes. Now listen to me very carefully. We are 20 minutes over. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Sorry, but not sorry, right? This coming Tuesday is very important. You must vote. If you've not already voted, you must vote. Take your souls to the polls. That's S-O-L-E-S and S-O-U-L-S too. Vote the front of your ballot, but vote the back of your ballot. And on the back of your ballot, at the bottom, is your school board, your local school board, there are four seats. You ain't got to vote but for one. But there are four seats. Please. We have some materials out front for you. If you follow the slates, the Fannie Lou Hamer slate. If you follow the Michigan Chronicle. The black slate. This year God allowed us to make all three of those. Hallelujah. But the church slate is stronger than all of them. If you've already voted, thank you. But call five people and make sure they vote. Amen? Somebody say amen. Please vote. Now, I have served with seven amazing women on the board. Four of them are running. And they may not do this for me, but I'll do this for one of them. And that is Angelique Mayberry Peterson, Peterson Mayberry, Amen. who is the president of our board. I recommend, and I can't tell you who to vote for, but we have been amazing as a team. And it's important that the vision of the board and the superintendent is not disrupted by barn burners. There are people out there running that say they were around a long time ago. But you were on the board when we went into state takeover. Why would we put you back on the board? Because you were on the board when the state took over the district. Because while you were on the board, you could not manage the district. Be wise. Be wise. The proposals are vitally important. There is proposal one, two, and three. Vote. The judges are important. There is one African-American woman that is running for the Supreme Court. Please vote. Be careful of your ballot. Color it in completely. Do not do anything on your ballot that will cause your ballot to be discarded. Don't take pictures of your ballot because they would throw your ballot away. And they're doing what they need, what they want to do right now to discriminate against our vote so be mindful be careful of all these new folk that showed up out of nowhere trying to run for this this position on the board let's be mindful let's be very careful your vote matters now on tuesday somebody say tuesday i need volunteers like crazy we have two shifts from 7 to 2 and 2 to 8. 
If you're going to work the polls on Tuesday, we had one meeting on yesterday, and thanks be to God, we had several volunteers, but we need about 30 more to vote, to, to work the polls on Tuesday. We will be here Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. We will be here at 5.30. 6.30, we'll go to the polls. Come and get your poll assignment, your literature, your T-shirt. Come and get the verbiage so you know what to say at the polls. Hello, somebody. Amen. And then when the polls close and the last person is voted, we are going to Royals to watch the results. And that is where we will have the celebration party. Amen. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen again. We have literature. If you still need to pass out literature, we still have some literature for you. But we have a lot more literature for Tuesday. I have had an incredible walking team. And Liz was here earlier. If you want to walk with us today, 3 o'clock. Is she still here? That's Miss Liz. Miss Liz is really a member of this church for years. But she and her team have walked these streets all of these last two weeks. Would you praise God for her? And we're going back out today at 3 o'clock. Again, tomorrow, we're going back out all day. We're still throwing cards. We're going to the polls tomorrow. People are voting. But get on the phone. Make sure everyone votes. Amen? Come on, stand up on your feet, Pastor. Come on up and speak to the people and give us the final closing remarks. Put your hands together for your only father. Amen. First of all, I want to say I'm volunteering to work Tuesday at the poll. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Come on, clap your hands for one of the greatest messages you have ever heard in your life. Amen. Uh, I finally figured out what a guest speaker was. I guess I'm speaking next Sunday. <laughs> but that's the way it worked. But the message is so powerful today. So powerful today. I just want to say one thing. It didn't say because he obeyed God. It says he obeyed. See, I found out I was a child that obeyed, but I wasn't very obedient. God willing, we may talk about that. That's what formed legacies. That's what formed things to continue. That's what makes you a founder. She only covered your father today. He's a founder. So I'm just grateful for the message. I, if, you, I, if you enjoyed it, I will clap my hands again. Amen. And with that, I'm just going to thank God. I'm glad to be home. Amen. Amen. There were so many men here today that I could have laid hands on. Say, yeah, they, look, just throw it in. <laughs> but we are not meeting our potential. And we don't know why. But we will learn. Father, we honor you. And I just thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here a part of Henry Lewis' legacy. The man that built a church for the saving of his family. I honor you just to be a part. Thank you for the bishop that carries on the legacy. Because there is no legacy if there is no one that believes in it and carry it on. We bless you today for everyone that is here, for everyone that heard the message of God. May it sink into their hearts, and may they have listened with the intent to do, which means that they have heard the message. And then when they leave this place, they can use that message immediately, immediately to continue their life. We ask, O oh God, that you will go with them, Lord, and be 
friction to their tires, stability to their feet. And that when they return, they will return with an aim, a desire to do the will of God and build his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. The peace of the Lord is with you. Founders Day reception is in the foyer. Please grab a, a keepsake. Please go out this door. Amen. If you need materials, go out that door. God bless you. Praise him. All creatures here be long. I heard that. Oh, praise him above ye Say, oh.